families with children so that it does not expire in the new, near future. And we know what a difference, as you've heard from families and as we have talked with families around the community, that that makes. Throughout uh, the pandemic, we have been so fortunate to have a mayor who believed in medical science and actually let that direct uh, his policies and the policies of our community. He's demonstrated courage and compassion, and despite continual interference from Governor Abbott, even now as so many children uh, are being exposed to infection in our schools, he stood firm. Uh, we appreciate his leadership, and I'm pleased he's here to welcome the speaker today. Mayor. Madam Speaker, Congressman, people here in Texas know what it looks like when the cavalry is coming over the hill. <laughs> I want to thank Foundation Communities, real proud last week for the City Council to, to pass a, a big grant to co-invest with Foundation Communities, deeply affordable housing, and, and to help with some of the permanent supportive housing for those experiencing uh, chronic homelessness in our city. Uh, but the House of Representatives right now, poised to take historic action to invest in, in, in America and in cutting taxes for working families, really going to help us here in Austin. First, you passed the American Rescue Plan. You helped keep businesses open, and you kept unemployment rates down. Just announced yesterday, Austin's unemployment rate, 3.9 percent, lowest among major cities in the country, would not have happened without the American Rescue Plan dollars. They kept a lot of businesses open and surviving and kept workers' jobs available to them. And now we need you guys to take the next step. More affordable housing, bring down the cost of prescription drugs, drugs elder care, Make it more affordable. I understand you're going to consider free universal high quality pre-K, clean energy tax credits. You're going to allow women to get back to work. But the focus for us in so many ways is on health care. Here in Travis County, one of six people under 65 have no insurance. Due in large measure to the fact that our state leadership will not expand Medicaid which is just outrageous and has a huge impact on our community. You know, that makes our uninsurance rate 50 percent higher than the national rate, and that should not be the case in Austin, Texas. One of three Hispanics under 65 in our city have no insurance. You know, among the horrible things the Texas legislature is doing right now in their 600, 700 bills that they're passing is to take away the right for cities to be able to see that all the workers in their town have sick leave. We need federal action. We need you guys to step in to help. We need the federal government because our state is not protecting us the way that it should. We support the goal of building an economy from the bottom up and the middle out, not just from the top down. Health care coverage should be a right for everyone and not just a privilege for the wealthy. Welcome home, Speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Exactly one week from today, about this time, uh, I'll be at the Ways and Means Committee in Washington as we take up the Build Back Better bill. Uh, and while that bill covers so much that the speaker can describe and that the mayor has just referred to, as a health subcommittee chairman there, my concern uh, is particularly on health. And the mayor has made reference to some of this, but uh, because Governor Perry and Governor Abbott were so ideologically opposed to taking 100 percent federal funding to start Medicaid expansion here in Texas, an estimated two million of our neighbors have never gotten any benefit out of the Affordable Care Act that we approved over a decade ago. Strengthening Medicare is a second concern. Uh, we know that as important as Medicare is to so many of our neighbors, that it does not cover benefits for hearing, vision, and dental. I have legislation that has been uh, co-sponsored by 100 members plus of our uh, caucus to expand that coverage, and we're working through that in negotiations with the Senate right now, hoping that not only will we close the Medicare gap, 
the Medicaid gap, but we will also close the Medicare gap on to provide more comprehensive coverage. Finally, thanks to the Speaker's leadership, the Affordable Care Act, which has offered so much hope to so many, literally millions of people, uh, and without the Speaker's leadership, we would never have had an Affordable Care Act back in uh, a decade ago. But with additional improvements that we made in the American Rescue Package, the Affordable Care Act marketplace insurance plans are now more affordable for many of our neighbors. Uh, and uh, uh, we hope to extend that so that it does not expire this year. So with the Medicaid gap, with Medicare expanded coverage, with an Affordable Care Act that provides more protection to the middle class, the question is, how do you pay for that? And we get a kind of a twofer here because one of the principal ways that we pay for it is by dealing with the problem of the outrageous cost of so many prescription drugs. Uh, and through, again, the speaker's leadership in dealing with uh, prescription price abuse, uh, we have the opportunity not only to save consumers money, but to save taxpayers money and then to use that money to fund these significant improvements. Uh, our speaker, uh, so almost solely uh, responsible for the importance of the child tax credit and for these improvements. Uh, she handles these very tough struggles with grit and grace, and we are fortunate that working with President Biden, we're about to have the, I think, the, the biggest improvement in the social and economic uh, safety net that we've had since uh, the New Deal. Our speaker, Nancy Pelosi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lloyd Doggett, for your very kind words, for your great leadership, and the pride you take in representing this magnificent district. It is an honor for the mayor to be with us today. I'm mayor's daughter. My father was mayor from when I was in first grade. When I went to college, he was still mayor of Baltimore. My brother was mayor of Baltimore. So when the mayor shows up, that's a really important occasion. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor, not only for your presence, but for your kind words about the rescue package and where we go from here, and for your great leadership of this wonderful city of Austin. Are we keeping it weird enough? Is that the, is that the deal? Okay, okay. Julian, it's such a, I can't tell you what, how your words are music to my ears and to, to anyone who is in public service. Uh, to hear the mission that you have, how you fulfill it, uh, the volunteers who participate, thank you to you, uh, to community foundation, uh, foundations, communities, and your Prosper Center here. And thank you to the volunteers who are here and many who are not, uh, but all of them important. Because the public policy that we put forth to help people for the people has to be accessible to them, whether it's linguistically, culturally, just informationally. And thank you for making those uh, connections. Uh, it's, again, a, an honor to be here. Uh, I want to take off, take up where Mr. Doggett left off. First of all, I accept any compliment on behalf of the House Democrats. Okay. <laughs> they, none of this would be possible without the courage, the integrity, the um, values-based uh, attitude that they have. And when people compliment them, me for bringing them together, I said, don't. I don't bring them together. Our values bring us together. And our overriding value is uh, to help America's working families uh, to lower health care costs by increasing paychecks, by having cleaner government. And we can talk about that, too, with the, what's happening with the voter suppression. But as we do that, he also mentioned, at, at closing his remarks, President Biden. President Biden has made all the difference in the world. He came into the uh, to office with a vision to build back better. And when we passed the when the Senate was passing the infrastructure bill, he made it very clear: I want to work in a bipartisan way to the extent that I can, and where I want to have bipartisan legislation. And he passed that in the Senate. But he said, I will not limit how I go forward my vision to what's in that bill. We must build back better. And what that entails, in addition to many of the health provisions, which I will return to, that Congressman Doggett has taken the lead on and mentioned here, that meant build back better by building back better with many more people participating in the economic prosperity of our country. I like to think of it as build back better with women 
but women, minority, but people of color, many new people into it. And many of the healthcare provisions are what are liberating for people to participate. If we can have family and medical leave paid, paid family and medical leave, if we can have what was mentioned about the um, home health care for our seniors, for people with disabilities, even for our children, that enables people to be able to be more free to be in the workplace. Child care, child care, child care, very liberating for mostly moms, but dads too, to be in the workplace. As was mentioned early, I mean, uh, um, universal pre-K, so important for the children. But also, children learning, parents earning. So it's all connected to building back better. And the list goes on, workforce development and the rest. One of the pillars of the, when we did the affordable health care, we thought we were establishing a pillar of just Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and uh, the Affordable Care Act. But we knew we could do better, and we did in the rec rescue package. And as the mayor indicated, many of the provisions in the rescue package it was remarkable. The president came in. That, that bill went out there. It was immediate and urgent. Vaccines in the arms, money in the pocket, children safely preparing for school, workers safely in the workplace. Money in people's pockets, very important. And so now we have to build on that, go beyond what was immediate for COVID, but to extend, as Representative Doggett mentioned, extend them, whether it's child tax credit, whether it's... Um, uh, Affordable Care Act provisions, which are improvement, but they need to be extended. Central and vital to it all is the uh, Medicaid ex expansion. This is something that we absolutely must do. It is almost an immorality to say, I will not accept money from the federal government for 100% paying for the Medicaid. My decision is I will cut millions of people in my state or hundreds of thousands in another state from having access to health care. Because health care is a health issue. It's also a financial stability issue for families. It's where it all comes together. So we will have more permanent provisions to make the Affordable Care Act more available to many more people at a lower cost. We will have Medicare expansion, as Mr. Doggett mentioned, with visual hearing and dental benefits that we will have in the bill. We will have Medicaid expansion, but we have to see how much and for how long, and that depends on the total package. And we have to do all of these things right now in a way that gives people liberation, freedom, to be in the workplace because their parents, their children, their siblings who may need care uh, are cared for. And again, it's not just about that. It's about education, about educa investing in construct school construction, workforce development, community college, and the rest. It's about housing. Housing, Julian mentioned all that. It's about housing, several hundred billion dollars in there to have more housing stock and affordable and other as, and for low-income people and, and some provisions to enable that uh, to happen more readily. So, and, and it's about saving the planet. So when we say build back better, we say that's a good in infrastructure bill you have that you have in a bipartisan way, but we want to build in a way that preserves the planet. And so we have provisions in there that are, we will have provisions in there that are very important. A t in a health sense, the air our children breathe, the water they drink, in my case, grandchildren, well, my children too, okay, there. <laughs> Uh, for the children, the air they breathe, the water they drink, for our jobs to be in the lead in the country, in the world on green technologies and the rest. It's a, a security issue. Our security experts tell us migration, a drought, uh, rainfall, all different aspects of climate have an impact on access to habitat and resources and the rest and our cause for conflict. Health, jobs, security, morality. If you believe, as I do, that this is God's creation and we have a moral responsibility to be good stewards, or even if you don't and you just understand that we have a responsibility to future generations to pass this planet on, 
then we need to have those provisions in the re reconciliation package to complement some of what was done uh, in the infrastructure bill. The list goes on and on, and just to give you a taste of the array, because it all comes down to uh, the education of our... I always say the three most important issues facing the Congress are the same. Our children, our children, and their children. Their health, their education, the economic security of their families, a clean, safe environment in which they can thrive, a world at peace in which they can reach uh, their fulfillment. In the Congress of the United States, Lloyd Doggett has been a champion on each and every one of those issues. There's almost nothing you can talk about that you can't say Lloyd did this, was in the lead, gave this, took, uh, initiated the idea and the rest. So thank you, Lloyd Doggett, for your great leadership. Relentless, persistent, dissatisfied, effective, making it happen in terms, he knows of what I speak. <laughs> And he's, he's just been spectacular. I can't talk about Lloyd without talking about Libby. If there ever were a team of two people coming to Congress and representing their district with great pride and great values in the rest, it's Lloyd and Libby Doggett. So thank you to Lloyd as well. So thank you for sending both of them to Congress. Before I go, I want to acknowledge Mike Forbes, a former colleague of ours, Deacon Mike Forbes, a former colleague of ours from the Congress who's now here. Thank you, Mike Forbes, for being with us. But in any event, we're very grateful to our president, Joe Biden, uh, for insisting on his vision to build back better in a way that takes us in a transformative way into the future as we meet the needs of the people. Uh, I just want to say that uh, when we talk about health care, we have to talk also about women's reproductive rights. Uh, what happened in the last several, what, 36 hours or so uh, has been stunning. Uh, the Supreme Court making the decision that it did not only disrespected women, it disrespected the Supreme Court and its former decision, its precedent that it established as Roe v. Wade. When we go back to Washington, we will be putting Roe v. Wade codification on the floor of the House to make sure that women everywhere have access uh, to the reproductive health that they need. I say that as a mother of five children, and I um, respect everyone's decisions, their personal decisions, but that's why we have to give them uh, the ability to make those decisions. It is, um, it's, it's really kind of sad, but nonetheless, People know now what the challenge is. And many of the women who will be disadvantaged in this are women of color and poorer women and the rest. It's an injustice. Not any disrespect of all women, but an injustice. So we want women everywhere, in Texas and everywhere, uh, to have the respect they deserve for their decisions about their own reproductive health. And again, much of what we can do, we can do better if we can pass H.R. 1, which is the, uh, the bill to uh, end voter suppression, and we've had your Texans in Washington welcome them time and again with great pride, and they're really leaders for the country, and kept the, the momentum going on that, and we hope to pass that legislation as well. But that, again, it's an honor to be at uh, Communities Foundation Prosper Center, to be with, uh, with Julian, and to be with the mayor of the great city of Austin, Mayor Adler, and with the great member of Congress, a leader for our country, Lloyd Doggett. Thank you all very much. Thank you. I think with that, we'll just throw it open for uh, questions from the press and then uh, have a chance to visit briefly with the speaker before she heads to her 315 appointment. So <laughs> she's here to answer the questions. Uh, please uh, proceed. Anyone with a question out there? Yes, sir. Well, first and foremost, we have our responsibility in the House, which is legislation. And we have, uh, in, whether as, as Lloyd and as many of you know, we operate in three ways. One is with funding, one is with the tax code, and one is with pol at making policy. And we have 
uh, able to show our respect for women's right to choose, not only in our own country, but with uh, globally to make sure that women have access to family planning and the rest. But to codify Roe v. Wade it will make a tremendous, tremendous difference. And that is where our focus will be. Yes, in terms of uh, a whole government response, I, I fully appreciate that. And that really will just mean increasing some of what we had done in the past that was curtailed, so we say, in recent years. But we look forward to working with the president to prioritize that. Our, we have a, our um, reproductive freedom task force in the House, and they've been working on this. When we do codifying of Roe v. Wade, I just want to make one point. We will have an amendment to it to um, make sure it captures the, uh, shall we say, action taken in Texas that made it uh, it makes it difficult to uh, to explain, but nonetheless, we will mitigate for that damage that they are causing here as well. Did you want to say anything? No. Well, agree, just agree with you heartily. Uh, this is a real setback, I think. Uh, Justice Sotomayor's dissent uh, was so powerful uh, regarding the disgrace of this court and the injustice to women all over the country. Uh, other questions? Yes, sir. <laughs> yes. I was just asking if other states may follow uh, what what they may do. In oh the yes, there may be copycat legislation. Right now, the the case that will probably come before the court is from Mississippi, which is 15 weeks. Um, that is, we'll see how they judge there. But there will be other states that may copy the Texas model, which is not a state action, but right of private action, which is uh, clever, very, very dangerous. And so, you know, we expect to see copycats. And that's why it's necessary for have the national law passed of, of, Roe v, of Roe v. Wade protecting women's rights wherever they live across the country, whatever their economic status is. I, uh, I, I really don't speak for the Republicans. <laughs> they like it that way. <laughs> so do I. <laughs> I don't know. I, you know, I'll just close by saying this. <clears throat> Lloyd has heard me say this so many times. President Lincoln said public sentiment is everything. With it, you can accomplish almost anything. Without it, practically nothing. But for public sentiment to prevail, people have to know. Well, right now, people do know the danger that reproductive health is in. And we are talking about termination of a pregnancy here. But understand this. In the Congress, the Republicans have been opposed to contraception, family planning, anything that would um, minimize the need for somebody to make such a decision. So it's not just about, they, they like to talk about extreme cases, but what they've, they're deflecting attention from, family planning, fam, family planning, birth control, they don't support any of that. They do not support any of that. And that's most unfortunate. And I can say that, as I say, I have five children, five and six years almost to the day within the week, and that was a blessing that God gave us. That's our family's decision. Other people should have the choice uh, to be able to meet, to do what meets their family's um, prospects and the rest. So uh, I think we have to be, <clears throat> let me say this, I'm very prayerful about this. This is so personal for people. This is about who they are. This bill in Texas, it said they couldn't even talk like to their husband about what their decision might be. It doesn't have an exception for rape and incest. Incest. How disrespectful can you be of women and their reproductive rights to say such a thing? What could they be thinking? But in any event, what it does do is, because most people didn't think this could happen. Nobody would ever do that. Yeah. Now they know that every, somebody would do that. So 
uh, what, uh, what, uh, nothing is more eloquent to a member of Congress than the voice of his or her own constituents. So when they hear from their own constituents, then we'll see how they would vote. But again, this is personal. People have their, uh, their religious views and the rest. We want to be respectful of that. And we want them to be respectful of the reproductive rights of America's women. Yes. I, I have a question. Well, uh, first, I just want to emphasize the pain that I have seen in the eyes of a family talking just like we are, who have come up and I've had to tell them, you're too poor to get any federal assistance. And that's what's happened here in Texas. Two million of our neighbors who have not been able to get access to a family physician with any uh, federal or state support because of ideological objections. The plan that Texas was originally offered would pay 100 cents on the dollar for about three years, and it would be scaled down gradually to over seven to 90 percent. Uh, I've actually introduced a separate bill that if all else fails, we would permit direct contracting with local governments like the city of Austin, uh, Harris County. We could cover half of the people uh, who are eligible in Texas just in three counties, letting them contract. Many of them are ready and eager to do it because getting a hundred cents on the dollar for three years and then eventually over seven being having being asked to cover just ten cents on every dollar that is spent is really an important deal. And some areas have even said they would cut local taxes if they could get this Medicaid expansion. So I think the sustainability argument had nothing to do with economics or health care and everything to do with political ideology as we've had one governor after another trying to compete to be the Trumpiest. Are there other, I think we're about there then. I, yeah, I would just close by saying, uh, while it's understandable that after such a horrendous decision, questions of all of us would center in the need for action would be very apparent. But one week for today, from today, those two million Texans who don't have access to a family physician will get an answer, I believe, from our committee. And the millions of seniors who uh, cannot see well, cannot hear well, or cannot eat well will get some relief through better Medicare. And thanks to what the speaker has already done, there will be more people coming to the next room here uh, who are hardworking folks who will be able to get a no or low premium affordable care marketplace health insurance policy because we have made uh, for many more years those tax credits available. That's what Build Back Better is about in the health care area, and there's so much more beyond that. Thank you very much, and thank no, you, Madam Speaker. Sure. Thing, because you mentioned eat well. <clears throat> food insecurity, or as my kids say, don't call it that, Mom. People are hungry. People are hungry. Food insecurity in our country is rampant, and the president has been such a leader on this in his executive actions and the rest. Nutrition is a health issue. It's a health issue. So in, our, in the totality of these packages, we're trying to address all of the needs of the American people, for the people. And I just would say, getting back to um, the decision, this is... Um, Again, I come from a pro-life family and the rest of that, and that's nice for them. And my position is nice for me, and I respect everybody's position for themselves. In other countries like Ireland, they had a referendum on the ballot. They had two, actually, two different referendums. One was marriage equality, which passed in the Catholic country of Ireland, and they had one uh, about abortion. I don't even like to use the word. And, and, um, and it passed in Ireland because people did not politicize these kinds of issues. They shouldn't be politicized. It's very personal, and we want to make sure if we can take it back to a place respectful of those who have their choices to make sure that all women uh, have theirs as well. Let us salute Roy Doggett again, Mayor Adler, <laughs> Julian Fuentes. Julian, thank you. Thank you, thank you all very much.